So, Tabitha. Tabitha's not a name we hear much. Tabitha was a pretty ordinary woman, and also quite extraordinary. She was ordinary because she was a woman, and likely a widow. She sewed. Extraordinary because she was a disciple. Yes, a female disciple. In the Bible. So we're all on the same page. <laughs> and she was extraordinary because of the way that she cared for others. The story tells us not that she was a seamstress, not that she made clothes, but that she clothed people. She cared for other women, especially the vulnerable, with good works and acts of charity. And she was so extraordinary that when she died, her community, those that she had cared for, refused to accept it. Not only did they not accept her death, but they were so certain that it would not be final that they did not bother anointing her body with burial salts, but rather sent for a known healer and reviver, a follower of Jesus known as Peter. And it's extraordinary, of course, and rather unbelievable for many of us that she was raised from the dead. It's absurd enough for us in 2022 to try to understand this idea of resurrection in Jesus's life and the miracles that he performed, but then to understand that these phenomenon continued in the nascent movement of those early apostles. In Acts, we hear an amalgam of stories of people who belonged to this movement. We hear stories of conversions, of healings, of life after death. It's as if they occupy a world wholly other than our own, where the impossible is possible and the extraordinary is common. What would that be like to refuse to accept the bounds of what is possible, what is normal and what is normative? We live in a highly rational era, an era where science is heralded above spirituality as if they were separate and opposing fields an era in which we take truth as so important that we wonder whether it is even okay to propagate myths and fairy tales to young children, even very popular ones about important holidays that create moments of unbelievable joy and involve gifts. We put signs on our lawns about facts, science, and truth, which is all well and good and important until we realize that we are clinging to facts so tightly that our current reality becomes the only possibility in our minds. We lose the imaginative and hopeful part of ourselves that can ask, what if? We live in a Humpty Dumpty world where we wouldn't even bother to try to put Humpty to get back together again because we know how that story ends. And so what do we do with a story about a group of friends who refuse to accept the facts? Well, let's back up a minute. Tabitha is a leader. She's a leader who cares so deeply about her community that she has made sure that no one is hungry or naked. She has refused to let the norms of poverty and need rule within her circle of influence. And she has cultivated such a network of women around her that in her hour of need, those that she has cared for surround her with care. And when that care was not enough, they send for the one person they think might be able to help. They are so steadfast in their care of Tabitha that even Peter has to go to great lengths to get them to give him a little space to work. In short, they do everything, absolutely everything, everything in their power to save her life. They refuse to accept death. They refuse. It's a powerful act, refusal. Children seem to understand this innately. They learn it faster than they learn language, and they allow it to possess their entire bodies, and they use it readily. They refuse with words, with body language, with screams and foot stomping and hold bodies thrown on the floor, regardless of where they are, even in church, if you witnessed a few minutes ago. 
They refuse with tears and hands pushing, and they refuse early, and they refuse often. And despite what my own child displayed a few minutes ago, I have a sense of relief <laughs> when the toddler age began to turn the corner to preschool and the moods of refusal began to wane. And I will emphasize began. <laughs> because of course, most of the refusal was of the authority that I try to impose. But then I began to wonder if it is not such a good thing that they unlearn this art. A week and a half ago on North Fullerton Street in front of the Planned Parenthood, I found that what I longed for most was the ability to recall that full arsenal of refusing power. The ability to summon not just my own act of refusal, but the force of the majority of millions of people who reject the idea of bans being placed on our bodies. And again yesterday, when the need to refuse the evil and violence of white supremacy once again became painfully, painfully real. The need for not just black people and people of color to continue to refuse that evil, but for white people to really join in that refusal. The power of refusal that Tabitha's friends demonstrate reminds us that we too could refuse. I didn't want this sermon to be about abortion. I really tried for it not to be. And it says something in and of itself that in 2022, a minister in a denomination that has publicly proclaimed and advocated for full, safe access to abortion for decades in a progressive town in a blue state is still hesitant to talk openly and unreservedly about abortion. And I didn't anticipate that this would be a Sunday when once again, Whatever would be said from this pulpit would have to denounce white supremacy, would have to denounce gun violence even as much as we need to denounce those evils every week. But this story today too clearly speaks to both of those realities. It struck me that when Tabitha needs health care, her friends, her community of women that have cared for her, have to send for someone from out of town because maybe no one would help a woman in Joppa. Perhaps in Joppa, the healers were scared to be associated with a woman on the margins. Or perhaps the only healers in Joppa required payment and the widows couldn't afford it. Maybe that procedure that Tabitha needed wasn't covered, wasn't in network or wasn't legal. To be clear, we have no idea what was wrong with Tabitha and why she died. And it's none of our business, really, what it was that saved Tabitha's life. But we know that her network of friends did whatever it took to save it. They refused to believe that Tabitha could not be healed. And like most women, I've been part of that community of women searching out reproductive health care for a friend who needed it. And I've met plenty more people after they needed such a, such a network. A million complicated and private situations which can't be reduced to a political slogan. In Tabitha's day, in the days before Roe, in the days of Roe, and perhaps in the days after it, women and those that stand with them have guarded the sacred knowledge of refusal. Some clergy and people of faith have continued in the tradition of those friends of Tabitha, finding health care providers elsewhere for women without means or women in places where no healer will treat them. And perhaps then, as now, there were religious leaders who would have scoffed at healing Tabitha or argued that religious law forbid it. But in the tradition of Jesus, who asked whether the law was made for man or man for the law, other clergy and religious people have refused to let women suffer when access to health care could alleviate it. Fifty-five years ago this month, in May of 1967, as mainline Protestants and Reformed Jews called for the liberalization of abortion laws, a group of clergy in New York City founded the Clergy Consultation Service on Abortion, or CCS, an international network of clergy that helped women obtain safe, 
legal and illegal abortions from licensed medical professionals. Over 2,000 ministers and rabbis across the U.S. and Canada became a part of this network. And in five years, the CCS helped between a quarter and half a million people in need. These clergy, doctors, and other friends embodied that same spirit and circle of care, that same refusal to accept death and suffering as Tabitha's friends. Or perhaps Joppa had been structurally segregated and denied resources, drained of health and denied opportunities to flourish. And Tabitha, seeking life and sustenance for her community, was targeted because of her resilience. Perhaps Tabitha, like Pearlie, like the victims in Buffalo yesterday, was an ordinary person who became victim of an extraordinary evil and diseased society. It's clear that what is needed is not just to mourn, but for a wider circle of care to form in this nation that refuses to allow the violence of white supremacy to take any more lives. It is not enough for us as white people to continue to shake our heads or point to the perpetrator as wholly other than us. At what point will we refuse to allow this evil to continue? to demand from lawmakers some accountability and from ourselves and our white brothers and sisters some repentance. What refusal can we, as people of faith, summon to counteract the power and pervasiveness of racism? As adults, there isn't much that we regularly refuse, really refuse. We too often become cynical and accepting of reality resigned to the status quo, even when that status quo means death and suffering. Tabitha's story is a reminder that refusal can be the ultimate act of care and the ultimate act of faith that God desires full humanity for all people and has empowered humanity to create such a world and in fact empowers us to refuse to accept anything less. May it be so.